okay yeah. so the second topic is uh, and the in thing for the uh, icu and the critical care and i believe uh, this will just touch the surface of what we do in the intensive care in the emergency in terms of sonography and um, i'm sure the speaker is going to deliberate on uh, dr subendu bajpai and he is a practicing critical care medicine for last 10 years he is member of the institutional antimicrobial stewardship program has many research publications currently working as a post cardiac surgical icu and his core interest areas are in cardiogenic shock rv failure ecmo septic shock and focus so here we have uh, a speaker interested in focus and i believe the presentation is going to be of massive interest to the surgeons who want to uh, go into the realm of focus on bedside for critically ill surgical patients so uh, in please go ahead dr shubendu thank you very much sir for the kind introduction and uh, thank you team jst for giving me this opportunity to share my views on uh, point of care ultrasound in the icu shubendu please share your screen also uh, yes sir yeah please go ahead i hope i am audible and the presentation is visible to all yeah yeah please make it um uh, present uh, like yeah yeah okay slide good so go at the outset this is my disclaimer i am not a radiologist or a cardiologist and because of the brevity of time that we have uh, we'll just like uh, professor uh, singh said we'll just go we'll touch those topics we'll just go through the uh, uh, we'll just touch them you know because uh, the entire point of care ultrasound is a is a two days workshop and i have to uh, finish it in 20 minutes so uh, uh, we'll give a brief introduction to the podcast uh, we'll go through the uh, usd guided cannulation procedures fast how to analyze dbt cardiac ultrasound lung ultrasound rush and then we will conclude this so why do we need ultrasound in the first place to enrich and enhance our patient evaluation uh from times long times history and physical examination has been there then came lab investigation and then came radiological imaging to analyze and to approach the patient to evaluate the patient so the next question is that which imaging is better in the icu taking if we take into account all these things portability safety easy reproducibility dynamic imaging the cost involved and the image quality i think uh, ultrasound is the modality of imaging which uh, it stands the test of time on, in all those parameters it is portable it is safe no risk of radiation involved it is reproducible you might you may do it as many times as you want it is obviously the cost of the machine is expensive but using it repeatedly is not that expensive and the image quality definitely depends on the operator if the operator is experienced the image quality is good what is the utility of focus why do we need point of care ultrasound in the icu there is some diagnostic use to it there is some therapeutic use to it and we can use ultrasound in the icu for repeated assessment diagnostic uh, use is like uh, lung ultrasound can be used to diagnose pleural effusion pneumothorax consolidation in a patient short of breath a patient who has come to us in a in a clinical picture of cardiogenic shock we would like to confirm it with the ultrasound and try to find out whether it is rv failing whether it is lv failing or whether it is a uh, fluid collection around the heart a patient with distended belly yeah clinically we are suspecting it as ascites we would like to confirm it with the ultrasound patient with a swollen limb yes we would like to put a linear probe on the femoral and try to uh, demonstrate dbt there saving a lot of time and making the diagnosis quick therapeutic uses ultrasound guided vascular cannulation the in thing ultrasound guided paracentesis abdominal paracentesis thoracentesis and percutaneous tracheostomies as well and repeated assessment so volume assessment uh, like our previous speaker said uh, urinary bladder assessment sometimes you know in the icu the urine output is uh, not coming yeah the urine output is decreasing or the urine output abruptly stops and uh, despite of doing everything despite of fluids despite of diuretics the urine is not coming and at uh, the moment you flush the catheter the urine starts pouring so you can confirm all these things with ultrasound there how does the usg probe work 
and i have a very small presentation on this Dr. Shibundu, it's not audible. If you can speak something about it, I guess the video is not audible. Is it? No, it's not audible. Okay, no issues. So the whole idea of uh, showing this video is that uh, AC current is applied to the probe. There are piezoelectric crystals in the probe. The piezoelectric crystals generate ultrasound waves. The ultrasound waves goes into the tissues. They strike the structures in the tissue. then they re re uh, reflect back refract back and some of them get attenuated in the tissue so those uh, ultrasound signals that come back to the piezoelectric crystal on the probe are then converted into the images on the screen so that is how our probe works the next uh, thing of concern is echogenicity yeah so we say gray white black on an ultrasound what sense does it make there are certain hyperechoic tissues like diaphragm tendons and bones which reflect back a lot of ultrasound waves there are certain hypoechoic tissues like most of the solid organs or thick fluid in the body which uh, which create a grayish uh, kind of appearance on the ultrasound screen and then there is fluid blood and urine which uh, do not reflect back any ultrasound waves and hence appear black on the screen coming to the basic nobology what buttons on the ultrasound machine are of prime importance for us as a beginner the switch on switch off button the depth adjustment uh, switch the gain adjustment switch and the switch with which we can change the trans transducers so the higher the frequency of the probe the better the resolution the linear probe which we have has higher frequency and hence we are able to get better resolution of the superficial structure so better the resolution and lesser the depth the lower the frequency of the probe the lesser the resolution and more the depth like the curvy linear probe the curvy linear probe gives us good depth analysis but with a lesser resolution what is gain gain is just a fancy term for you know brightening the screen or darkening the screen you increase the gain the screen brightens you decrease the gain the, the screen darkens a brief slide on transducers linear transducer with a frequency of 5 to 13 hertz you see on the screen this is the this is a probe with a maximum frequency the maximum frequency the best resolution and the most superficial structures curvy linear probe with a frequency of 3 to 7 megahertz phased array probe but the cardiac probe with a frequency of 1 to 5 hertz now coming to usg guided vascular access the more you do the better you get why do we want to do it on the first place why isn't blind vascular access cannulation good enough so what are the advantages of using usg you identify the accurate location of the area of interest you identify anatomical variation you identify if there are any venous or arterial thrombus within the vessels and you avoid damage to the nearby structure what does evidence have to say in favor of usg guided central venous catheter insertion a randomized trial of 900 patients published in critical care in 2006 the slide says it all carotid puncture the first figure is usg guided the second figure is blind procedure it is self explanatory now coming to the approaches longitudinal approach see uh, here we are looking at the right igv of a patient yeah the i want to use the marker the pointer so this is how my igv is going right this is how my igv is going here the right igv and along with it i have placed my usg probe just on top of it parallel to it this is the longitudinal approach this is how i place my probe and see the from the width of the probe just at the middle of the width of the probe i want to introduce my needle and this is how the needle will appear yeah so i have made the entire jugular vein visible here on the screen and then my needle is approaching here from the middle of the probe coming to the transverse approach so this is how my internal jugular vein is going and this is how perpendicularly i have placed my linear probe and i'll introduce my uh, needle from here 
and this is how it will look on the usg screen this is my needle here this is the internal jugular vein yeah coming back to anatomy this is the internal jugular vein this is the artery here this is the vein and here is the needle now coming on to so this is the principle transverse approach longitudinal approach this is the principle you can use it for arteries you can use it for vein you can use it for jugular you can use it for femoral wherever you want however you want now coming to use of usg in trauma setting a very i have a brief scenario to share 24 year old male present to the er after a motor vehicular accident conscious with a heart rate of 130 blood pressure of 80 by 50 looking pale resuscitation started after securing cannulas investigation sent and monitoring is attached the question that every even every each and every physician has in mind is that where is he bleeding from we need an answer so just call in the ultrasound we will perform a focus assessment with sonography in trauma that is popularly known as fast where do we want to place the probes in the right upper quadrant in the left upper quadrant in the cardiac region and in the supra pubic region in cases of extended fast we might also have a look at the bilateral pleura so you know uh, if there is a motor vehicular accident with some intraperitoneal bleed and you paste a curvy linear probe mind you we will be placing a curvy linear probe because we want to have a look at the in depth structures so most of the things can be visible with a curvy linear probe when we are performing a fast so you put a curvy linear probe in the right upper quadrant and if there is free fluid this is how it is going to appear yeah the the slide is self explanatory you have liver here you have diaphragm here you have lung here you have kidney here and this morrison pouch between the liver and the kidney has having free fluid here which is clearly visible on the ultrasound so uh, uh, a patient with hemorrhagic shock a patient sinking coming to the er you have a cause so we will target for source control and resuscitation simultaneously similarly when you uh, place this curvilinear probe on the left upper quadrant the structures visible to us are lung the diaphragm the spleen and the kidney and here we can see that there is collection above spleen and below the diaphragm that explains sometimes when we put the probe subcostally this is the picture we can get you see the pericardial sac here and the heart floating inside massive fluid here similarly when we place the probe uh, uh, suprapubic in the pelvic area this is the bladder distended and this is free fluid in the pelvis so all these are giving us one comprehensive answer without wasting time without shifting a hemodynamically unstable patient to any radiological places and directly taking calls taking the decisions about how to address this patient further abdominal trauma this is a slide addressing the utility of the fast abdominal trauma unstable patient fast positive shift the patient to the operating room fast negative you might uh, want to resuscitate the patient and maybe do a ct later on stable patient fast positive shift the patient to ct confirm the diagnosis and take him to the or if needed if the fast is negative then you stop then you repeat your fast and you observe and depending on the clinical picture you take the further course correct a 65 year old female operated case of femur neck of fracture uh, neck of femur fracture pardon me comes to us with right lower limb edema after one month of surgery poorly mobilized after surgery yes edematous limb post operative patient poorly mobilized what is the first differential on our mind it is dbt we want to confirm it how much time does it take here comes the usg machine you place the linear probe on the femoral area say if there is a right lower limb you place the linear probe on the right groin with the pointer of the linear probe medially and this is a picture you get yeah femoral vein with a clot inside femoral artery how how do you how do you make a call whether this is thrombus how do you say this is dbt so there are certain direct signs you can see the thrombus within there is incompressibility if you want to press the vein it is not getting pressed the diameter of the vein has increased there is no pulse wave doppler there is no color flow doppler and hence you confirm the diagnosis of dbt in a lady with a clinical history and physical features of dbt within no time now coming to the cardiac evaluation in focus 
So what are the objectives? See, we are not cardiologists. We don't want to, you know, calculate TAPSE, calculate MR, calculate TR and whatnot. We just want to eyeball the heart. We just want to know as to why the patient is going in shock. Are, are, is the LV kissing? Are all the ventricles shrunken? Is the IVC shrunken? Is the patient hypovolemic? Is the patient hemorrhagic? Or is the LV dilated extensively? Has the heart failed? Is the patient is in cardiogenic shock? Or is the RARV dilated with a clinical background and physical examination of DVT with a clinical background of pulmonary embolism? Is the RARV dilated? Is there TR? Or we, in, a, in a backdrop of uh, some cardiac procedure uh, with a low cardiac output, we want to look for pericardial collections. We want to look at the IVC. So, uh, first of all, we would want to know uh, the, the different basic views of 2D echo. And then based on those views, we will uh, want to know as to how a failing RV looks, of how a failing LB looks, how a pericardial collection looks and how the IVC looks. So this is the phased array probe or the cardiac probe which is commonly used with the footprint here, the pointer here and the body here. These are the common areas from where we analyze the heart. This is the subcoastal area before, be beneath the ziphi sternum. This is the apical area beneath the nipple in the left fifth intercostal space. This is the parasternal area, the second and third intercostal space. And this is the suprasternal area. So now coming to the views. How do we make the view of a parasternal long axis? So this is our phase that probe with a pointer pointing towards the right shoulder in this fashion. This will cut your heart in this fashion. And this is the image on the echo. LA, LV, mitral valve, aortic valve, LVOT and RV. This is the kind of image you, you can create with a parasternal long axis view. Now in the same position here, we will just rotate the probe in such a manner that now the pointer would be pointing towards your left shoulder. And now your probe is cutting the heart in this fashion, showing your RV here and showing your LV here. We will see uh, videos in the coming slides to make the things more clear. Apical four chamber view. At the apex of the heart, with a pointer towards your left shoulder, cutting the heart like this, this is the image that you get. LA, LV, mitral wall, RA, RV, tricuspid wall. Subcoastal view, beneath the ziphi sternum, like this, beneath the ziphi sternum and pointing towards the left shoulder. This is how it cuts the ultrasound beam, cut your heart and this is the image that we generate. Now, let me show you how a normal study looks. Yeah. A parasternal long axis view, LA, LV, mitral wall, aortic wall, and RV. Parasternal short axis view, LV, RV, good contractility. This is a normal study, nothing to worry about. Let us go through a clinical vignette. A 55 year old male, chronic diabetic hypertensive, presented to ER with chest pain and shortness of breath, ECG suggestive of. ST elevation, MI in lead, V1 to V4, cardiac markers are positive, all of us know this is MI, but the vitals are heart rate of 120, the pressure of 80 by 50, saturation of 90%, bilateral auscultation reviews, coarse creps, the peripheries are cold and very, very low urine output and catheterization. All things pointed towards cardiogenic shock before we have a ABG to demonstrate metabolic acidosis and increased lactate. In this setting, I want to have a look at the heart. So a failing LB, patient with cardiogenic shock, this is how it is going to look. This is how it is going to look in parasternal long axis view. This is how it is going to look in a, this is how it is going to look in a parasternal short axis view. Yeah. The clinical vignette I am sharing just for all of us to, you know, corroborate it clinically. RIRV dilatation. A 65-year-old female operated case. This is the same lady which we took there in DVT, but now she is having a operated case of neck of femur fracture, right lower limb edema after one month of surgery, shortness of breath with tachycardia and tachypnea. These are the additional features which she is having now. Poorly mobilized after surgery. Yes. The vital heart rate of 130, blood pressure low, saturation of 82% on room air, the respiratory rate is 25 to 30. Auscultation is clear, the chest x-ray is normal, our suspicion goes towards pulmonary embolism. We somehow want to confirm it. What will we do? Here is the echo, making a apical four chamber view. The R is dilated, the RV is dilated and there is some TR. Forget about the TR, we don't need to know the TR, but the RRV dilatation in the 
clinical setting of a pulmonary embolism with a swollen limb at the same time i would also want to put a linear probe on the femoral vein and check if there is dvt presence of dvt with rrv dilatation in itself is self explanatory for pulmonary embolism now 50 year old female taken up for tpi ended up with worsening hemodynamic and pale look and cold peripheries rising lactase dropping urine output see she was taken up for tpi something has happened there suddenly the patient has started to deteriorate the hemodynamics are worsening the peripheries are cold the urine output is dropping i am wondering something has happened in the cath lab i need to place a probe on the patient the moment i place a probe this is the image that generates i would like to play this uh, short video which would demonstrate uh, pericardial collection and tamponade in this patient you see a lot of fluid around the heart the heart is flowing inside the fluid the moment there is diastolic collapse of ra and rv in the setting of pericardial collection it becomes cardiac tamponade so from cardiac tamponade the cardiac tamponade reminds me of the five t's of cardiac arrest t for cardiac thrombosis mi t of pulmonary thrombosis pulmonary embolism t with pneumothorax and t with tamponade so all those five Uh, the toxin obviously cannot be addressed with ultrasound, but the rest of the four T's can be addressed and analyzed with the help of a ultrasound. IVC assessment. So, say uh, you are in the ER and uh, a eighteen-year-old female comes with diarrhea, vomiting, nil perorals since one day, tender abdomen, history of food consumption outside two days back. Yeah, everything is pointing towards uh, food poisoning, maybe, and uh, she is dehydrated. and the tongue is dry and she has not passed urine since one day and she is tachycardic and all those things and you know i want to resuscitate this patient if clinically she is dry i will resuscitate it how long how long will i resuscitate the patient and how am i assessing the improvement of the volume status of this patient yes i can do it with the help of ivc assessment see the heart the ivc the hepatic vein opening in the ivc this is a normal ivc of less than 2 cm and there is a lot of variation with breathing this is a dilated tot ivc with no variation with respiration and this is the difference how do we see the ivc we just place the probe subcostally and we just turn the uh, usd probe in such a manner that the pointer now comes upwards now coming to uh, lung ultrasound uh we have discussed so far uh, fast we have discussed dvt and we have discussed cardiac ultrasound now coming to lung ultrasound which is the second last topic of the talk uh, why do we need lung ultrasound patient with shortness of breath patient with desaturation patient with uh, tachypnea we want to find out as to why the patient is in distress uh, a patient is intubated and uh, the patient is desaturating i might, i can rule out endobronchial intubation with the help of uh, lung ultrasound the patient comes with failure uh, lbf i can diagnose as to a patient with a known case of copd and low uh, ejection fraction comes to me uh, he is in pulmonary edema yeah on auscultation there are post crep but i want to confirm this diagnosis with the help of ultrasound i can do that pleural effusion yeah cirrhosis cardiac failure chronic heart failure those are the patients with pleural effusion trauma patients with hemothorax they can be easily diagnosed with the help of lung ultrasound pneumothorax can be diagnosed pulmonary embolism uh, not with the help of lung ultrasound mainly but with the help of uh, cardiac qd echo we can do that usd guided procedures thoracentesis pleural tapping can be done with the help of lung ultrasound so just a general idea you know sternum here sternum here anterior axillary line here and posterior axillary line here for the convenience of the use of uh, the usd we have divided in broadly into six areas 1 2 3 4 5 6 yeah and the landmarks are sternum anterior axillary line and posterior axillary line how what is the probe orientation so uh, uh, when we want when we want to look at uh, pleural effusion hemothorax uh, those are the times we will be using uh, curvy linear probes uh, then we want to look at the artifacts of the lung ultrasound that is the a lines the b lines we will be using linear probes yeah why linear probes because the a lines and b lines are the uh, are the artifacts of the pleura and the pleura is a very superficial structure so better resolution and a very superficial structure so we will be using linear probe so what is the probe orientation here when you are placing the probe in such a manner that it is crossing you are cutting the ribs it is longitudinal placement when it is along the ribs it is transverse placement of the probe 
ಇವೆ ಜನರೇಷನ್ ಒಂದು ಲಾಂಗ್ ಅಲ್ಟ್ರಾ ಸೌಂಡ್ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಬೇಸಿಕಲಿ ಅ ಲೀನಿಯರ್ ಪ್ರೋ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ಡ್ ಆನ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಲಾಂಗಿಟ್ಯೂಡ್ನಲ್ ಮ್ಯಾನರ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಲಂಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಇಮೇಜ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಜನರೇಟೆಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಫ್ರಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ದ ಸ್ಕಿನ್ ದ ಸಬ್ಯುಟೇನಿಯಸ್ ಟಿಶ್ಯೂ ದ ರಿಬ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಯು ಸಿ ರಿಬ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಬೋನ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಶೈನಿ ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಚರ್ ವೈಟ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಪ್ಲೂರಾ ಅಗೇನ್ ದ ಪ್ಲೂರಾ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಟು ಅಪಿಯರ್ ವೈಟ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಇಂಟರ್ಪ್ರಿಟೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಲಂಗ್ ಆರ್ಟಿಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ರೈಟ್ ಲಿ ಸೆಟ್ ಸಿ ಸ್ಕಿನ್ ಸಬ್ ಕ್ಯೂ ರಿಬ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ ರಿಯಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ರಿಯಲ್ ಸ್ಟಾಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಪೇಶೆಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ಲಿ ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಹಿಯರ್ so from plura and beneath whatever is there is the artifact so we also want to interpret the artifact lung ultrasound initially it was thought that air is a poor tra- conductor of the uh, ultrasound waves so uh, ultrasound is useless in lung but uh, gradually over the decade they have analyzed that understanding and interpreting the artifacts of ultrasound will help us uh, uh, differentiate a lot of conditions yeah so lung line is a plural line which we saw the bright structure shred line you know in consolidation there is sometimes the shredding of the that plural line a line what are a line here we come these are a line long horizontal hyperechoic lines fading vertically indicating reverberations at regular intervals indicating the presence of air so presence of a lines is a normal phenomenon you see this is the plural line so the distance from skin to the plural line this distance will keep on reverberating again a line again a line again a line and it will fade these are transverse hyperechoic lines now i will be showing you lung sliding what is lung sliding the to and fro movement of the pleura with each breath is lung sliding and it is a normal phenomenon actually this video was supposed to play but So, coming to no lung sliding, um, I am sorry that I am not able to show you the video, but uh, the movement, see, the movement of the pleura here and there to and fro with each breath indicates lung sliding and that is a normal phenomenon. If this pleura is stuck here and does not move with each breath, uh, then that is problem. That could be endobronchial intubation, that could be mucus plugging or entire lung collapse and that could be pneumothorax as well. So, this is B line. what are b lines sharp razor like hyperechoic lines arising from pleura and going to the end of the screen indicating presence of water in the lung parenchyma what could be the reasons of the water in the parenchyma pulmonary edema consolidation ards anything once the b lines are there the a lines are gone b lines and a lines both cannot coexist yeah coming back to a scenario till now we were studying the artifacts the b lines the a lines the lung sliding we were using the linear probe here okay here we are with pleural effusion or hemothorax here we will be using a curvilinear probe a 40 year old male comes to the emergency room with motor vehicular accident with following vitals we can see the patient is hypotensive tachycardic desaturating and tachypneic and having a bruise over the right chest the air entry on the right side is decreased the moment you place your curvilinear probe on the right chest this is the image you get fluid in the right pleura diaphragm here shiny bright structure liver underneath it the floating lung here and lot of fluid here in the setting of a motor vehicular accident if you see fluid in the pleura it it, it is it is a no brainer that this is hemothorax and uh, we would want to put it in there without wasting any further time now coming to the last topic of the talk rush rapid ultrasound for shock and hypotension assessment of undifferentiated shock you are sitting in the er the patient has come in shock you don't know the cause of the shock we want to put the probe in this certain position first we want to analyze the heart the heart parasternal long axis view parasternal short axis view and apical four chamber view then we want to look at the ivc whether it is dilated or it is collapsed then we want to look at the pass places uh, the right upper quadrant the left upper quadrant the supra pubic area then you want to look at the aorta why do we want to look at the aorta whether it is aortic dissection or whether it is abdominal aortic aneurysm which has burst or what we want to rule that out also and then we will have a look at the lungs so now we will analyze as to how looking at these places so the mnemonic for this is high map heart ivc morrison aorta and pulmonary how by looking at these areas we will be able to differentiate one kind of shock from other kind of shock the moment you put the probe on the heart and you see there is pericardial effusion with diastolic rv collapse it is a no brainer this is cardiac tamponade this is obstructive shock 
and the only treatment in case of cardiac tamponade is pericardial synthesis as soon as possible without wasting any further time you put the patient you put the probe on the patient and there is right ventricular dysfunction i am alerted there is some possibility of massive pulmonary embolism there is some pulmonary hypertension i would want to put a linear probe on the femoral center uh, uh, rule out a dvt also in this scenario we see lv dysfunction when we put the probe on the heart lv dysfunction with a plethoric ivc no brainer cardiogenic shock lvc dysfunc uh, lv dysfunction with ivc which is collapsing or normal yeah, i'll i'll move further i'll see if there is free fluid in the abdomen if there is abdominal aortic aneurysm if there is abdominal aortic aneurysm yes then you should look on the lines of abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture if there is free fluid in the abdomen it it suggests fast positive and then you want to uh, see as to where the internal hemorrhages and uh, and, the, and the fast will take on from there if all these things are negative with a normal heart then think of other causes like sepsis anaphylaxis toxin drugs and dehydration yeah one thing where does lung come into play tension pneumothorax is one uh, emergency causing shock in the patient obstructive shock in the patient which can be ruled out with the help of lung ultrasound so uh, concluding my talk i would say that the use of ultrasound saves us time saves us money saves us radiation saves multiple lives and the more you practice the better you become but here is the caution there is no risk in placing a probe on the patient but there is risk in making decisions based on your usg assessment thanking you all of you i think uh, shubhendu did uh, a great job in the small time and these are huge topics in intensive care uh, he has just touched the surface and sure. therefore those surgeons wanting to venture into ultrasonography in the uh, critical care surgical patients it needs a lot of time practice patience and uh, a ready feedback from your intensive care people working in the icu i think uh, i'll congratulate shubhendu and the entire team for the packet that was given today um, thank you dr kapoor i'll hand it over to the moderators ravi anand any closing remarks uh yes sir uh, definitely uh first of all uh, uh congratulations to bendu for uh, concluding a two days workshop in such a small time uh with a such of uh, such a short notice basically shubendu was just called a couple of days back and he was ready with the presentation now uh sorry for the uh, time that we took 10 12 minutes extra sir uh but because of the technical glitch we cannot just help it uh definitely uh these topics have been selected uh, for surgical critical care specifically because we just need to sensitize the audience of jaipur surgical uh, tutorial uh, on these salient topics that a surgeon needs to know uh, whenever he came across a critically sick patients like we started with how to assess your patient in ward who is going to sick who is going to icu right from that uh, initial assessment and then advanced assessment here we'll go to the management and recovery part tomorrow and uh, i wish that uh, we'll see more and more participation tomorrow thank you sir over to you please uh, a few words if maybe <laughs> anand anand jain you want to say something thank you thanks to every speaker who has been here took out the time after their regular schedule and uh, the chairpersons thank you thanks to all and thank you kapoor sir for giving us this opportunity to introduce critical care to the surgery residents thank you thank you sir so once again i would like to thank all the faculty uh, and uh, uh, for uh, your time and contribution uh, tomorrow or at this time i have a session in my meeting so i may not be there so i would like to thank everyone again i would thank ravi and anand privately later thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you sir we will close yeah